Explosions. They can also hear you. That's fine. <laughs> you just want me to stop saying it, Justin. Good morning, Reaper people. It is Thursday, and boy, do we wish it was Friday. Oh my gosh, do I wish it was Friday. But first of all, Bug Lips, thank you so much for your resub. You are already subbing at us. Hi, Rings. Hi, Panache. Hi, Riot. Hi, everybody. Here's my little sing-song voice for you. Good morning. That's what I do to my dog in the morning. She loves it. Yeah. We heard you say nothing. <laughs> Yay! Although actually the splooge of paint is actually a good icon for today because it, it appears that I'm just like dropping things and spilling things all over the place today, so. All right. Hello, 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 hello. Good morning. All right. Well then, and some of you I know it's not morning, so apologies for that. <laughs> Hi, painting dog. It's good to see you. All right. I was just saying to Justin that we need an icon for Kiri. Like, you know, although she's not really the Reaper dog, but she, she should be because she comes to work every day. And there are people who come by to pet her every day. So I think Kiri needs an icon. Maybe I need to drag her up here and stick her head on the show in order for her to get, get an icon. I'm not sure. So how's everybody? Everybody looks pretty chipper this morning. Y'all look looks pretty, pretty darn bumpy, you know, like boop, boop, boop. You're all good. Hi, hello, D. Clearman. I see you up there. Yeah, bloop, pretty much. I secretly think Thursdays are their favorite because there's three shows. Oh, any dog that comes to work every day gets to be the official dog. I, I uh, agree, painting dog. Although there are some dogs that seek to, you know, un unseat Kiri. I mean, but seriously, if Ron's Corgi gets an icon, Kiri should get an icon. Because Ron's Corgi does not come to work every day. Yes, three shows. Yes, well, Reaper is my addiction. Given your tag... I would be very surprised if you uh, weren't all happy because of three shows. Um, oh, fixing your chair. I hate that when that happens. All right. So today we're doing part three. This is the first time I've done like a three part in a row series on a subject, but Steel NMM definitely warrants it. Um, so today we are going to finish out our Orky. Uh, well, at least we're going to we're going to do the last subject, which is a curved surface, i.e. breastplate. Um, <laughs> and oh, yeah. Do, do, do. No babies, Kiri. Old dogs is the best. It's true. Oh, Tamaskin. Yeah, Kiri looks like one of those. Although she doesn't have, uh, she doesn't have that lineage. Tamaskins being a blend of Husky, Malamute, and German Shepherd. And some of them are wonderful dogs. All right. Looks like everybody's ready to go, Justin. I think, I think because we don't have, you know, a ton of babble and questions right away, we should switch to Orc Cam. All right. Oh. I do have Orcs. Uh, let me get Orcs' little tag here, so he's good. That's his name. There we go. We're good. Orc with greatsword. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad you got your minis, Panache. All right. Let's see here. I'm, my brushes are all out of order and all over the place, and I don't know what I'm doing. Ah! I am not a professional. See, I, I too can use that hashtag, except it's kind of a lie because I take money for my work, so therefore I am, by the nature of the thing, a professional. So let's start with Mr. Orc. I don't really need my little thingy. I can keep him kind of in focus. Well, it's easier to keep him in focus if I rest him on the thing. All right, so I'm going to restore my little lining that I did between his plates. Yeah, I think I'm going to try it. I'm going to try to get there, Twisted Oma. Uh, as long as it all goes well, I'm going to try to do some sky reflection, and I'm going to try to do some rust. Hi, Coops. Ah, Oh, 11 ponies and 5 horses. That's a lot of work is what that is, Rings. A lot of work. Horses are not for the faint of heart. I learned that as a teenager. And when things go wrong with horses, they tend to go catastrophically wrong. But I did ride for a bit when I was a teenager. I took lessons. The, uh, my 4-H painting instructor's daughter was uh, serious into horses, and they, they, uh, they had a farm, so she started giving me riding lessons. I, I did manage to stick on when a horse tried to buck me off. She was pretty impressed. My balance is good. My coordination, not so much sometimes. Uh, yeah, exactly. For that kind of job, you've got to love it to do it, right, Rings? Because, like, it's like when you own a lot of dogs. If you Like, when we were actually uh, Shiloh Shepherd breeders, we owned four dogs. And it was a lot of work, but you do it because you love it. Well, you love the dogs. You love the animals. And they need you, so you do it. Um, that said, being down to one dog is a lot more, uh, a lot more relaxing and less work. I'm just lining a bit to set this up. Um, I find that lining gives me a better idea of what my highlights and shadows on the metal actually look like, just giving it kind of a dark border. 
Um, I did shade underneath these yesterday, but I think I lost some of it. So I also shade with a little bit of the same liner or shadow color underneath the little, little guys there to help them stand out, the little rivets. And I'll probably put a little bit of a shadow just to set off this lower part. I'm going to probably end up fudging most of it out because it is facing the light technically. Um, but I want to kind of define that area. Now, if you remember, when we looked at our lighting situation yesterday, we saw that there was a definite shadow. You can see it now on the camera. This side was definitely lighter. There was a bit of a shadow underneath his face. So we're going to do that. Never have more dogs than you have hands. <laughs> That's a really, really good uh, rule, actually. I'm gonna have to, gonna have to tell. Uh, that explains it because uh, Vanessa had like five or six. One of our breeders, our president, our club president, at, at some time, but she had children at that time, so you know she actually had multiple hands. Ah. Yeah, it's all good, uh, Panache. I mean, and all of these orcs, I find, because uh, of Trey's sculpting style, uh, are very good practice for NMM, uh, for the v different types of it. I mean, there's definitely a reason that I chose this guy. Um, well, other than we have, we have a lot of him, so I knew he wouldn't sell out, which is always the annoying thing, right? If I do a uh, sample model for you guys and recommend it as a tutorial model, I want to make sure we've got enough of them. Um, so that we don't suddenly get out of stock and you guys are all like, oh, you know, I don't like, I don't like the sad faces. So I want to keep everybody happy faces with Reaper. So yeah, but this guy, I mean, as you can see, just from what I've done, it's, it's really good practice on numerous types of surfaces. So you get the chainmail practice, you get the sword practice, and then you're going to get the breastplate practice. So today, I think I'm going to de-emphasize the, uh, that split, the line, the, the um, divot on the breastplate. Like there, it does come up to an angle on a couple of plates, but then this top plate is more rounded and it doesn't have that sharp angle. Um, and I'm thinking I'm going to de-emphasize the angle this time because yesterday I kind of showed you uh, how to do it, how to emphasize it, right? So we don't need to do that. We can do it totally different. Hey, planar crossroads. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> It depends. Uh, if you, they're t They were teenagers who had been raised on a working farm, Skinny T, so I'd say Vanessa's kids definitely ha added hands and had gotten used to. And of course, the, the plus side for them is then that as soon as they could escape from home, they did. <laughs> so, so Vanessa's not stuck with kids still at home. <laughs> she worked them hard enough that they're like, heck no, I'm getting a job, we're going to school and getting out of here. It was funny. I know several friends whose kids are still at home, so I've, I have to applaud the, uh, the farming mentality. Ah. Let's see here. All right, so I'm blocking in my shadows. You guys can see that I blocked it in. And, and again, blocking, you don't have to worry about blending, but I still kind of use a blending brush stroke. I still go in the direction that I'm going to go uh, for the most part. Um, I'm not going to like do a vertical stroke because I don't want to accentuate this line coming down the center. I want to soften it more. So let's see here. I'm going to, I'll set up my highest highlight next, I think. Let me uh, actually block in. There's a little bit, there's some connections up here that I did not do in gray and I want the white to show up. So I'm going to actually hit these metal plates that connect the straps real quick so that everything shows up. Well, there we go. Now we'll have some contrast. I think that's a healthy attitude, Planar Crossroads. I mean, don't let, you know, the child labor department hear you say it, but, you know, other than that. And, and like I said, that, that incentivizes them to escape you the moment they can, and so you don't end up, you know, paying for their food for an additional two, two to four to six to 16 years. I know I like wanted to get out of the house as fast as I could. And my, my parents didn't have, you know, they didn't abuse us too badly. <laughs> but, uh, but there was definitely like uh, the freedom clause, you know, like definitely your curfew, you know, definitely could not always do what you wanted, had to clear everything with the parent, parental units, you know, things like that. So I was pretty eager to get out of the house and on my own and be able to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. Speaking of which, Let's see here. Oh, Rohan, it is never a bad thing to get too into sculpting. Even if you do miss a stream, I can always be uh, 
vodded or YouTubed. Are you sculpting scales on the dragon neck? That I saw a picture on my Discord last night or yesterday. That's a good way to be raised, Ripper is my addiction. <laughs> well, thank you for coming to this one. When you are self-employed, it is uh, it's hard to remember calendars and time frames. Oh, and on that subject, I was about to say, I am uh, listening, not reading, but listening to an audiobook, uh, an excellent book right now, which is uh, entitled, it's, it's in, f title is When, and then there's a, parenth there's a parenth parenthetical uh, after that, but uh, it's about, like, the science of time and chronology, and about, you know, like, night owls and morning birds and all that stuff, and how people's chronologies uh, are different. Um, and how it's not always night owl and morning bird. There's actually a sizable percentage of the population that are uh, what they call third birds, which are in the middle of that. You aren't at your best, like, really early in the morning, but you're not a really late night person either. Um, and it's about the science behind all this stuff. And it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating, actually. Um, I was going to say, the reason I brought this up is because on the subject of children, they've actually demonstrated that scientifically that your um, chronology changes throughout your life. So just like we all remember being real night owls in college, that's actually true. Like there's a biological basis for teenagers and college age uh, people to be temporary night owls. Like you shift more toward the night owl spectrum when you are in those age groups. And then as you age, you start to shift back to toward, you know, um, whatever your natural chronology is. If you're not, if you're not already a night owl, presumably if you're already a night owl, you stay that way. Um, and then as you get older, like as you pass 50, you actually slide toward more the morning bird type of thing. Uh, so if you're a night owl, you'll find yourself maybe sliding into third bird territory uh, and not staying up as late as you used to as you get older. So I thought that was really fascinating. That not only, it isn't absolute. Not only is it not absolute and not only is there a midground, but it changes throughout your life naturally. And it's not true for everybody, obviously. You know, studies are based on the majorities, but I still thought it was pretty interesting because I've noticed that myself. Um, I was very much a night bird in uh, a night owl in high school and college, and then I went back to being kind of moderate now, and I notice I'm sliding earlier as I age. So just a little little fun sleep science and you know diurnal activities, biorhythm science for you this morning. I like to um, listen to nonfiction when I like go walking uh, while I exercise. So I have uh, I usually have uh, audiobooks queued up, and I I like self help books, but I also like books like that that are like you know, kind of life hack books, kind of tell you actually this is the way like your body works and backs it up with science. And then also gives you tools for like utilizing that in your day-to-day -day life. Stay up until two and get up around eight. Yeah, look out for that Reaper's My Addiction. Sleep is important. I mean, you can do it. I, some people do do it. I, I don't know how they do it. Most people suffer greatly biologically if they do that if you only get six hours. But some people are good to queue on six hours a night, so more power to you. If so, you can get a lot more done than I can. My, uh, my current schedule is uh, about midnight to 5.30. Oh, Justin, you're um, going to kill yourself. I'm pretty Come sleepy, on. I'm not going to lie. But it's, re it's refixing my schedule, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how long I can keep it up, though, to be honest. Yeah, it's, and it does uh, a lot of damage to you biologically to do that, by the way. Like, you never really recoup it, so do be aware. The more sleep studies they do on people shorting their sleep, the more alarming it is. Like, it can raise your cancer risk. It's serious. So make a case for yourself to get a little bit more sleep. Seven hours is usually good to aim for as a minimum, if you can, if you can work it. You may not be able to. I know your commute takes a lot of time off your schedule. It does. Um, but, yeah, what is the book that talks about it? There's a, there's a sleep book out there that talks about all of the studies on uh, shorting your sleep and getting, you know, more sleep or the timing of your sleep and stuff like that. I, I'll save that one. I love these kind of books. I love these books that kind of illuminate, um, you know, how we, how we can mess, up with our, mess with our schedules throughout the day and whether it's good or bad. Mm, the other interesting thing from the book that I'm listening to right now, just in case. Let's see if we have any actual paint questions. Do, do, do. Planar Crossroads. Wow, that's cool, Planar Crossroads. You need only four hours of sleep naturally. That's crazy. Yeah, that's really unusual. Like, most of the population would really have an issue with that. I think I get by on, like, micro naps. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you can do that. So you like can like recoup. I'll be sitting here doing a giveaway processing mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll doze off for like 20 seconds <laughs> and I'll wake up abruptly and feel Interesting. refreshed. No, I'm kidding. I don't feel <laughs> You wake up abruptly because you were dreaming you were, uh, you know, in like uh, the Bahamas and then uh, you wake up and you're at Reaper and it's just, yeah, it's so depressing. What has caused mine more <laughs> so has is, is been my, I started streaming at night. So between that and like doing other research, it's, it's taken a lot of time. <laughs> Daphne, we were, I think more of us wish we died in our sleep, to be absolutely honest. I would prefer to like, you know, I would rather not die when I'm awake. That, that would just be like, yeah, that's the scary, scary thing to do. I would uh, much rather pass nicely in my sleep but uh but yeah what was this i was about to say oh yeah the other thing uh the other interesting thing is that uh it depending on your biorhythm you sh uh like uh most of the time like they say you know morning birds are are you know really at their tip top game in the morning but that's not particularly all of the facts uh it seems that during your peak time of day, whether you're a night owl or a morning uh, person, you, you're better at analytical tasks during that time frame. Corsair. Oh, yeah? Let's see yeah, him. Of course, says, when I die, I want to go peacefully in my sleep, like, <laughs> like yelling and screaming like his passengers. <laughs> Corsair. I'm just blocking in highlights now, guys. So I'll explain here what I'm doing. But I was, I was, while I was blocking, I was talking about sleep stuff. So, all right. So, oh my God, this is already looking like NMM. Something's wrong. Yeah, usually when you oversleep, you need it, Varl. So, all right. So here's what we got. We got our shadow, which is going to be pretty much right next to our light source. Remember, wherever our brightest light source is, and when it's shining from above, it's going to hit that right there. You just draw a line down the model, boom, it hits that area where I've got it. So your darkest shadow is going to be on the opposing side. And in this case, because the breastplate is curving, and this is true of any curved surface, including shields and things like that, because it's curving, the opposite side isn't downward, it's actually to the side. Um, because the light is glancing off here and it's not so much i mean it still glances off the upper edge which is why i highlighted all the edge work here um, because the light is still falling down when it comes to it but in this case the sharpest angle away from the eye is on the opposite side of this breastplate now we are going to put another secondary shadow on the other side because a cylinder obviously it's got two places where it's falling away from your eye so it's definitely going to do that we may not make that secondary shadow quite as dark however so you can already see that's starting to look shiny, right? Because that is the light next to the dark, remember, gives you that shiny factor. And the more burnished and the less chromey I want this to look, the more I want to blend these two, kind of have a transition between them. If I want it to be very, very sharp and mirror-like, then I use the sharp line uh, demarcation, just like Sky Earth, um, where it's shadow and highlight. So let's put in a secondary shadow. I'm going to mix my little gray section here with a little bit of my carbon gray. Um, as a reminder, we are doing, using car the Kickstarter triad for this, we're using carbon gray and moonstone blue and foggy gray, except that I totally forgot my foggy gray this morning, so I've been using pure white instead, and you can do that. You just got to kind of watch it that you don't get too harsh. Um, so now we'll take our carbon gray and uh, intermediate gray here is moonstone blue six drops and carbon gray two drops. I'm going to dip it in the water a little bit, and I'm going to block in kind of a secondary shadow here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to line it up. You line it up from plate to plate. Because remember, when you're looking at something across the field, it's just like chainmail, right? It's, things are reflecting in a mass. So what I'm actually doing here, if you look, is I'm painting a mass of highlight across all three of these scales and a mass of shadow across all three of these plates and then another mass of shadow over here. So do think of things in a total area kind of way. Don't always break it down from plate to plate, although you can get perfectly presentable uh, in a mem by doing the plate to plate approach, and I did for years, I've lately learned to look at it with a broader perspective and uh, find that I think it looks more realistic. So there's our secondary shadow, just kind of popping it in here, trying to make sure that it's all, all looking good. So secondary shadow, you can see the darkness there. This is coming off a little bit darker in the in the camera than it actually is in person, but we'll put us and now what we do 
is remember when we do this, we blend back up. So what we're suggesting here is that he's actually in the environment, right? So there isn't just gonna be one strong spotlight, there's gonna be reflected light. So just like on this sword where we went brightest highlight, shadow, and then built it back up, we're gonna do brightest highlight, shadows, and then build them back up. Um, and what this does, creating those bands of light and shadow, is it, one, it gives you the feeling of, of roundness, and two, it suggests there are things or light or objects in the environment around him. And if you're doing a very mirrored surface, this is where you can suggest like some color, maybe some green, um, or some, you know, you can suggest the blue of the sky if it's uh, a plate that's facing upwards, like this guy up here. Uh, or you could do some brown and green if he's in a forest, or if he's got red rocks around him and you've painted the ground like that, you can put some of that in the reflections. Um, Another place to put that for ground reflections would be down here on his boots, because this one is facing directly down. It would definitely have a reflection of the color here, and the interior surface of this one. So when you're thinking about putting colors in your NMM that reflect where the model is, which can also help you get more realistic, um, think about it that way. I am going to blend my Moonstone Blue and my white and my gray to get a lighter gray. And then I'm going to balance my mini again so you guys can see it better. There we go. Make sure it's in focus. And I'm going to bring up a secondary highlight. Oh, it looks like I forgot to paint that part. Bad Anne, no cookie. Doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo. Let's see. And you'll notice I'm not making this as bright as I was making my first one. I'll go up fairly bright, a little bit brighter than this, but I'm not going to go all the way to pure white like I did here. And I'll probably intensify this highlight a little bit too as I work it. Because remember, this is all just blocking in. And this takes a lot of the stress, by the way, out of NMM because you're able to just kind of block in your highlights and shadows. And even when they're blocked in and not blended, you can see that you're getting that metal effect, right? You want it to look right. Then spend your time like going back with layering or whatever and blending. Um, then you, you don't waste time trying to enhance an effect that, and then go, oh, that really isn't reading right. And we've all done that, um, I think. So I like the block. I like blocking in things a little bit more now. I'm currently blocking in a bunch of stuff on my Creature Caster model that I'm painting for Adepticon, and uh, there's a lot of NMM on that sucker. I don't know why I actually decided to do this in retrospect. <laughs> Golden Demon is looking downright uh, easy uh, compared to this model, but I did buy her because I liked her, and so it is an excuse to paint her. All right, so brought that up a little bit with Moonstone. See how that's starting to really look to read like metal now? Especially if you, since I'm using that sideways stroke, the light is kind of glancing and travel implies the light is traveling this way. Um, and so it creates that brushed steel kind of look. Um, yeah, Rohan, I think she's going to look pretty fantastic. I was, I was working on her last night a bit. I need to put more time in on her. So I'll need to figure out when I'm going to make that happen with uh, Patreon and work and all the rest of the things in my life right now. Many things. It's easy though, Panache. See, don't be afraid to try it. Just like get this model and like duplicate. Duplicate what you see. It's super easy. I also have a, um, a PDF on my, I guess this, I did mention the Patreon, so I'll just plug it now and, and be done. Um, I have a Patreon. Uh, I put out a lot of PDFs in addition to videos on there. Um, and there is an NMM PDF doing, dealing with this sort of breastplate um, step by step. Uh, on there with notes. So uh, it's uh, patreon.com slash painting big, all one word. And thank you to all of you who have uh, become my patrons. It really makes me feel happy. Just going to highlight the edge of this plate. But the biggest thing with NMM is just uh, learning the principles, like highlight and then shadow, and then blend back up to another highlight. And then you can even put another shadow in there um, underneath that, especially on round surfaces. You pretty much uh, transition between the two. Although when you're getting out to the sides here, you can really um, muck with things a little bit more. Let's see, I was gonna show you guys. Hmm. So that's kind of how I set up that side of the breastplate. And that's a very dramatic, like going to white and almost black like that gives you a very, very dramatic metal effect, as you can see. Well, thank you, Reaper is my addiction. No hurry, I'm not going away. I've been doing it for over a year now and I really like it. All right, so let's see. I'm just going to try to smooth in this little stuff a bit, and then I'm going to get, I want to do some rusty stuff. So when would I do, let's do, let's really, really quick knock in the other side of this. 
Let me get a little bit more Moonstone. Do this. Ah, but have you NMM'd any of the Arcade Void? Uh, if you've painted that many of them, I trust that you haven't, because otherwise your sanity would be leaking out your ears right about now. Doing NMM on armies is just like, or huge encounters is just mind-numbingly bad. Although it is a good chance to practice, but probably takes too long. Um, when I'm blending and stuff, I'm essentially using thinner paint, Magnetic Gumby. Uh, so right now, it's very blocky because I'm using thicker paint, so I'm not getting any blending. But if I was blending, I would be thinning my paint to a layering consistency, which is quite a bit thinner. It's like a, like a wash. It's like painting with washes is what layering is like. And I would be going over that area with thinned paint to blend it in, just like I did there. Um, and I would essentially keep doing it until I got a nice smooth blend. Like there. So it's, it's learning your paint consistency. And usually I advise people to start with layering at around a two to one paint consistency, two drops paint, one drop water. But some colors are gonna go even more than that. Some colors are gonna get closer to, to one to one. Like I think, I think pure white is around a 1.5 to one or a one to one. So it's very thin paint. It really is like painting with washes. It's not as thin as a glaze though. It's not just colored water because you do want to see it when you paint it over and you do want it to create a blend. Um, you use layering in conjunction with glazing to get most smooth blended effects you see on miniatures. Some people do wet blending, and I find I do a lot of spot wet blending if I'm working fast. Um, but layering is uh, superior in control. And a lot of times if I do set something up with wet blending, I'm only doing setup. And after that, I go in with layering to uh, fine tune it. Because layering allows you to be far more precise than wet blending. So you can really get in there and hit your highlights and your shadows and sharpen things um, and stuff like that. So yeah, good question. <laughs> At least you're not a humanitarian bug loose. Just gonna get in a shadow here, do another highlight there, and then we'll get on to there. A little bit of an edge here, a little bit of an edge there. All right, so there. So now the cool thing about doing NMM in this manner is that contrary to what everybody in the world has told you about NMM, it looks realistic from every direction. Notice this. Uh-huh. Maybe these people don't know as much as you'd think they do. Yeah, I never bought into that whole, your NMM only looks good from one direction. When you're working with very angular surfaces, it can be true. But even there, you can do some tricks to make it look right. Um, so yeah, don't always listen to what you hear. Try things. Think about things critically. Don't even listen to me all the time, because what do I know? So I'm going to brighten up this highlight here and make it really pop. Likewise here. And I'm highlighting, I'm brightening my highlights really in the middle of this highlight uh, area to make them sharper, uh, to make it really come out more. And then, of course, I want to highlight, I want a bright highlight on all of these rivets to make them stand out as well. There, there we go. So now we got bright rivets. And if we want to take those down, we can just paint some gray over them. Yeah, the nice thing about the mini painting community, though, to give uh, everybody credit, Silverthorn, is that um, most of us will tell you flat out that our way is not the only way. That there are plenty of ways to, you know, not to skin a cat, but to paint a dog. <laughs> Let's just to make more positive, uh, positive visualizations there. Um, and... Uh, you know, most of us will very much admit that there, our way may not work for you. You may need to talk to uh, somebody else who does it in a way that clicks with you, especially when it comes to teaching styles. Uh, not everybody's teaching style will click with everybody. You know, some people get a lot out of a teacher's class, and then you might take the class, and you're just like, this guy doesn't really, you know, doesn't really fit for me. Um, you know, and that's, that's perfectly fair. So there. Look, look shiny. Okay, let's screw it up. <laughs> oh wait, I should show some Skyros stuff. All right, so if I'm going to introduce blue, I've got two colors I like to use. 
Uh, boom, boom, boom. Using a bit of Moonstone in there is good, but if you want to really get some environmental effects, Ashen Blue used to be my go-to for Sky Earth NMM. Uh, it's a blue-gray, but it really does look like the sky down near the horizon, so it's more of a faded blue. If you want a more intense blue, Tropical is a good one. You want The sky has a hint of green in it, so you want a greenish blue, and the Bones Blues are greenish. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and you can also mix these two and get a pretty good mid-tone blue. And what I will do is I will not use it full strength. I will thin it down till I can see through it. That's kind of a heavy layering consistency. And I'm going to put it probably just to the side of the highlight um, because that's probably the place where uh, it's going to show up. Obviously, if you're reflecting the sky, it's not going to necessarily reflect in the shadow, although it may bounced light may give you that color. But I'll layer in that blue to the side of the highlight. And I won't necessarily do it down here because this plate is more vertical. It's not going to necessarily reflect the sky. So kind of think about what you're actually reflecting and where your plates are facing. Uh, the plates up here would have a lot of blue in them uh, around the shadows and highlights. Yes, Bug Lips has the profoundest statement ever. The important thing about painting with paint is to enjoy enjoying things. Yes, enjoy what you're doing. It's fun. Even if you think that you're not producing like something that's awesome, it's still fun, right? To put paint on little pewter people. So do it. Have fun. All right. And if I overwhelm my blue a little bit there, then I can pick up some of my Moonstone blue and kind of blend that in, make it a little lighter. So that gives you more of a sky reflection color. And if it did get too dark, yeah, you can always put a little bit of your Moonstone over the top of it to take it down. But just having it there is going to make your NMM look more complex. The thing to remember, though, that if you, is that if you do that, then you should repeat that color on all of your sky-facing surfaces um, to be consistent. Otherwise, it's going to look odd that you just have that touch of blue right there and nowhere else. Um, let's see here. Rust colors. Today, I'm working with reddish rust. What time is it, Justin? Okay, I see. I've got about 20 minutes. So, perfect. I'll have to do um, tarnish and rust um, on a metal surface. Well, I did it on the, the grudge bust, you know, way, way back a long time ago. Um, I did a thing when we were just testing out doing YouTube video. Uh, and, it, and that is kind of the way to do it on metallics. Um, doesn't carry as well on 28 millimeter as it would on something bigger. So like at, well, 28 millimeter giants or ogres, you could do the rust technique on. Now what I'm looking at right here, normally I use uh, rust brown, which is uh, 9072. However, uh, today I thought I would bring up, there was a color we brought up on stream the other day for mini painting studio, I think brought it up, was the tarnished copper, which is not a metallic, but it's for NMM copper. Um, it is also a fantastic rust color. If you look at it, it looks like a rusty orange. I could actually highlight it with Sunrise if I wanted to, to make it even orangier. <laughs> Silverthorn runs away. Oh, come on! It has not been that advanced yet, Silverthorn. Really. Seriously. Yeah, you, you, when you watch me splotch this on, okay, okay, so rust. Rust and rust is easier. Um, you think about where your rust would be. So if this guy's, right now he's got the shiniest breastplate of doom ever. I mean, no orc is going to have a breastplate this shiny. So, oh, come on, planer, come on. Okay, you, you go and have some tea in the corner, and, and meanwhile. So what you do is you take, say, I'm using russet brown, because um, it's going to be mucky. And in the cracks where water would pool, this is where you're thinking of, if he gets rained on, where's the water going to be, right? It's going to be in these cracks, and it's going to be down this divot down here. So I'm just going to stipple, and you don't want a regular pattern. You want little dots and specks and lines. I'm going to stipple the brown first. I want to lay down that brownish undertone. And then where it's really built up is where you're going to see the orange. So first we'll put down our brown, just like we're putting down a shadow and then highlighting it. Um, you can also put it, if you want, like around these, around the little divots here, around the rivets, there would probably be rusty, rusty residue, so you can put some brown up there. You do want to do a little bit about around each of them, even if your positioning isn't the same around each rivet, just because you want to carry the effect. And for this effect to carry, it really needs to be, and I'm going to need to, I think I need to lighten my camera a bit, Justin, because I don't, yeah, like brightness or, um, yeah, 
if you'll come over and help me. Just because I want them to be able to see it. I think the black is swallowing up my brown. I don't care if my hands get a little bit like crazy. We're going to try to adjust, folks. Ah, all right, maybe. Can we see the brown there? Ah, Justin is getting us up close. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Justin is our hero. Yeah, look it. You can see the little brown speckles. See? There we go. Yeah, now you can see the roughness of my uh, technique, by the way, guys. Yeah, so I would need to, to layer to essentially blend this in, but you can still see the effect. You can still see that the effect is correct. It's carrying correctly. I might have to dull down this highlight a little bit because it's not reading as right. But anyway, we're on to weathering, so I'm going to weather. Uh, so russet brown, and I can pick up a little bit of my tarnished copper too if I want, but in general, going to stick. And I kind of splooged that, but it actually went toward that crack, so it wasn't too bad. And you don't want to necessarily wipe out your, um, you want to use your brush and kind of stipple. You want an irregular, see the speckly pattern? Right. So you just, it's not that hard. It's just little speckles. Don't be afraid of it. Please don't be afraid. Please don't run away. It's really, really fun. Now what you might be tempted to do is go, but I painted this beautiful breastplate. Oh no, I don't want to mess it up. Well, in that case, do it, do this at this point, right? I've, it's already still messy. I haven't smoothed anything out. If you go for, through and you make a perfect layer and your breastplate looks amazing and shiny, you're going to be resistant to putting weathering over the top of it. So doing it after you've blocked things in but before you've refined them can be a useful tactic. Um, let's put some on the other side. We're doing Russet Brown 91.99. And I've also, I'm going to be introducing more Tarnished Copper, which is 93.05. But first we start with the brown, just because there's all this gook, probably, from all of the past people he's murdered and, um, you know, dust and grime, because he probably doesn't clean his armor very much because he's got all these nicks. Can also put some around those nicks to make it appear like they're grungier. Oh, my camera just shifted inexplicably. Oh, wrong way, Ann. There we go. Better. All right. So yeah, I'm just stippling and I'm trying to bring it up in places and more down in the cracks in other places and uh, trying to make it irregular, right? Because corrosion is pretty irregular. It's just going to be a happenstance of where the water happened to pool the night before. So now we've got a whole bunch of brown. Um, but yeah, paladins are definitely shiny in their dress plate, for sure. Um, so you always want to think about the, uh, the colors. Yeah, and you definitely want to get... Um, Russet brown because it's one of my my go-to colors uh coops. it's uh, essentially our equivalent rust brown or sorry russet brown is our equivalent for burnt umber in artist colors it is just a very utilitarian brown it's very nice and warm highlights up well with reds and yellows it's also a great leather color if you highlight it with driftwood brown 9162 you get a nice neutral leather dark leather um, I use it a lot. So, all right, so now we've got our dirt and grime kind of put in. So now we want an orangey color for our, where our rust is building up. And that's where tarnished copper comes in. And to a lesser extent, you can use sunrise, sunrise orange. You can also use burnt orange. Um, although burnt orange is a little bit too fa faded, I think. Uh, just a little bit. I would say it's about a three to one, Jay. Um, the bra the, I think this rust, this brown liner is about a three to one mix, so it's just a little. Now, if you thin it more, you can get a more subtle effect. So if you're working on a bigger breastplate, it may behoove you to, uh, like if you're working on a bust or you're working on like a big giant or ogre, um, you may want to thin your brown a little bit more because then when you're doing your stippling, it'll be more, it'll be more uh, like it's build up. It'll be less polka dotty and more like it's blended uh, right out the gate. And I find that that's a little bit more pleasing on a big model, but on a little model, you can get away with speckles because you're mostly, you know, seeing something from far away. It's, it's a tiny model. Um, so you can generalize. So... The tarnished copper, just a really useful color in general. I'm just kind of layering it here and there. It's not quite bright enough to read over a lot of that. Well, you guys can see it. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. Okay. I'm like, I'm wondering if the camera is seeing this. And then like places down here, places where the rust is going to be thick, like down here, I'm probably going to put a lot of this tarnished copper to really bring it up. 
And don't worry if you mess something up here. You can still go back with your colors, your steel colors, and, and like easily get it out. Because like if I messed up, say I, uh, here, I'll even mess it up on purpose. How about that? Oh no, I got too much copper on everything. What will I do? Oh wait, that kind of looks good. <laughs> okay, well if we were um, silly and decided that we didn't want that effect, we would take some of our gray again, and we would thin it about the same as I thinned this rust, about three to one. And we would reverse stipple, essentially. You just take your gray, get it on my brush, and just take, the, take it down into the rust. Instead of taking the rust over the gray, you take the gray into the rust. And you still use a little stippling pattern, so it's still like you're seeing the rust through things. See it? So that's where you go. Yeah, did, we, uh, did our fundraiser conclude? Hundred and fifteen bucks, guys. I'm glad you love me, Cleaner. I love you guys too. You guys make my morning really fun. Um, yeah, you can well, do water. You can do medium. Um, if you want to layer, you can just actually skinny tea. Uh, okay, these are made to be thinned with water. That was what I created them for. They they have flow improver already added to them so that you can get great effects with water. I don't thin with anything other than water and sometimes an extra drop of Reaper flow improver. Um, yeah, as Silverthorn says, if you live in a place with a lot of heavy metals or stuff in your pipes, uh, you may want to thin with distilled. Um, that's up to you. I think there are very few places in the U.S. that you need to do that. Maybe some big cities, like old, uh, somebody I knew who lived on Manhattan always used distilled because he just found that the paint, some lines of paint would get wonky. Uh, so now I'm going to do kind of a 50-50 mix of tarnished copper and our sunrise orange. I'm just going to kind of mix it up. Sunrise is pretty transparent, so I'm not really going to thin it very much. And I'm going to kind of even bring some more orange down into the bottom there. That's not bright enough, so I'm going to see. Maybe I'll go to pure sunrise. Now I'll mix in a little bit. Usually pure oranges don't read like rust because they're, they just, it isn't the right color. You need a little bit of brown, brownish color in there. So that's where tarnished copper comes in really handy. Let's see. But oranges are also a little see-through, so you don't want to thin them as much. So let's see. So there we go. And again, you want to concentrate on cracks. You want to concentrate on places where you think the paint, the, um, the rust is going to build up. I'm going to say most of it's going to build up down here. So yeah, putting uh, rust in is, is a little bit of an exercise, but it's actually kind of fun and uh, looks really neat. So now he's still shiny, but he's also corroded. Now if we really thought he looked too shiny and we wanted to really corrode him overall, I would take a little bit of my russet brown, pop it into a separate category, maybe a tiny bit of tarnished copper in there, throw a bunch of water on it and do a glaze. Um, I want to be careful with this because I don't want to really knock out all of my metal, but I want it all to look kind of dirty and right now it doesn't look dirty. So I'm going to see if I can glaze with this brown, let's see if I've got the right consistency. You want it to be really like colored water. I'm going to paint it across the surface. That might be a little strong. We're going to find out. I'm going to knock it down. And you're all going to panic because you're like, oh my God, she's painting brown over everything. What will happen? This is a crazy woman. Yeah, I am a crazy woman. Oh, look. Look, what did that do? That, that dirtied it up a bit, didn't it? It's still shiny, but it's also dirty. Essentially, um, by adding in that brown tint, it really makes the whole thing look like it's, it's starting to rust. Um, we lost some of our blue sky highlight, but we didn't lose all of it. And we still get, uh, we still have uh, our other highlights. Sorcery, yes, bug lips, exactly. Um, and now I can go back with my pure white and just hit the edge highlights. Like this is actually kind of the key thing when you, after you've tarnished something down, there are going to be points on that tarnished breastplate that have worn, right? The edges are going to, are going to probably be worn because whenever he's swinging his sword down or cross body, he's probably going to be rubbing the edges uh, and they're probably going to be shinier than the rest of it. So you want to use your white pretty strong. I'd say three to one, but you want it thinned a little bit so that it comes off your brush really even. Eh, I might have too much water. Let me squeeze out my brush and try again. We'll see if this is strong enough. So you want to figure out, okay, so maybe I want to extra highlight some of these surfaces. And you don't have to do it in a line either. You can do it in little spots where some, some highlights are longer than others. And that's going to create more of a realistic effect um, because really, you know, parts of it are going to rub off more than others. I think I'm going to 
highlight that part because it's probably going to rub against stuff. Likewise, this little bit out here, this bit down here is probably going to get rubbed because every time he bends over, it's going to get scoured against the chain mail. You got to think about kind of, you know, that sort of thing. I think that's a little light, so I'm going to knock that back. Knock back that highlight and bring it up in more of a blend so that it makes more sense with more of a lighter gray. There, that's a little better. Uh, so yeah, so that's where you get. And then with your scratches, like I've ignored my scratches thus far, um, you want to hit the bottom edges of those scratches to make them catch the light a little bit more so they stand out. Just a little bit to make them pop. I have also a little, a little scratch, and I'm not sure if it's actually a, a sculpt scratch or an artifact from the molding process, but there is a little scratch right here. So I can make that stand out. Um, I can darken that up too. I've lost some of the darkness. Again, the underside, wherever the light is going to catch. The light's going to catch on the lower lip of any scratches and things. So you can accentuate that. Get a little bit of hi edge highlight over here. Boom. There we go. Woohoo, I'm actually really happy with that. Also notice another thing, real quick, is uh, when I did that brown glaze, it not only knocked down and dirtied up the surfaces a lot, it also blended everything. Suddenly my transitions don't look so rough. That's what glazing does for you, and you don't always have to glaze with a color that you are actually using. Um, so yeah, so there you go. Looks pretty awesome, huh guys? I think that ended up really working. It also knocked down this highlight, which I wanted to do anyway, to make it look more realistic. So that, that oh, I can actually underline that one little scratch. Hold on, let me get some water on my brush and get my carbon gray. Make sure that my scratch itself is darker than the surrounding metal. Do, do, do. Let's see here. You want a really skinny brush and thin paint to pull this. There we go. There's our scratch. Well, thank you, Silverthorn. Glad you like it. So yeah, I think he turned out really well, actually, considering uh, it took us about an hour. Um, do, do, do. So not too bad for the result, actually. And normally when I, was, when I would do this, by the way, normally when I'd do this, I'd be working on all the plates at the same time. So I wanted to go a little quicker for you guys. Uh, difference between a glaze and a wash. Okay, so washes are thicker, Brad. You put them down so that they flow into the cracks and stay there. Um, so you let them pool, essentially. And that's why they have to be thicker. Because if you thin a wash too much, it dries in like rings and, and odd paint artifacts all over everywhere. So you need your wash to be thicker than a glaze. A glaze is colored water, like I did over here to go over the armor. What you're going to do with a glaze is you're going to blend in choppy layering or you're going to shift color like I used it here. I wanted to shift everything a bit dirtier so I put a russet brown glaze over my NMM so it shifted everything dirtier and browner but it also had the effect of smoothing all of the transitions that I had roughed in. So that is, those are your kind of your, uh, for washes I usually use a mixture of, I use brush on sealer to build my washes because I find it holds the paint together better so I'm not in danger of over thinning. My usual uh, ratio is two drops of paint, uh, about four drops of brush on sealer and about two drops of water, I want to say. Um, why a porcelain over plastic? Porcelain is so much easier to clean. This palette only cost me like eight bucks so it only costs me like six bucks more than a plastic palette and I just clean it, you know, it cleans right up back to white. Whereas a plastic palette, the paint sticks to all the time. It's very hard to get paint off a plastic palette after the first couple days. Um, what do I do? Uh, if I'm painting over the course of a couple days in this palette, I actually find that cling wrap works. I just put a little bit of extra drops of waters in the, w in the wells around the paints I'm using. I probably put one extra drop of water into each paint, then I cling wrap it. Um, with porcelain palettes, the cling wrap actually sticks really well. So I found that for if I'm painting over the course of two or three days, cling wrap works great. The other trick that Rhonda, bird with a brush on here, uses is a wet sponge. She'll actually just wet a sponge and lay it right over the wells that she is uh, using. So not, not like sopping wet, but seriously wet, not just damp. Uh, and just laid it over there and she says it keeps her paint like all week. So that is, uh, that's the palette 
stuff for you. Um, instead of brush on sealer, uh, matte medium. Yeah, if you're if you're doing um, if you're doing metal, true metal metallics, uh, future future ruble, you would use probably a gloss varnish. Um, if you want to use for this, uh, I'd use matte medium. Uh, our brush on sealer is very much like a matte medium. Um, so that's why I use it. Uh, weirdly, we tried to create a matte medium and a brush on sealer and everybody said the brush on sealer worked better as a matte medium. So I just kept it because not only does it work as a matte medium, it seals your mini. Uh, double great, right? So yeah, so essentially though, it's, it's matte medium and brush on sealer are the same. The, the thing that you are putting in, the thing you're adding when you add a medium is you're adding extra binder, extra resins. So every paint is made up of water and then resins and then things like silicates and, and uh, binders and other chemicals hold everything together. But the big thing is the resins, which are the acrylic or the, the um, simulated la uh, uh, synthetic latex or, or vinyl. Um, and those are what really hold everything in solution. So when you add too much water, you break the bonds between the resins, and that's why your wash turns into a, a very bad display of ringing. Um, but when you use a medium to build your washes or our brush on sealer, you're adding extra resins. And it's still, uh, because there's no pigment in it, it still makes everything more transparent. So you're getting the best of both worlds. You still want a little bit of water added to get the right consistency. I find that it gets a little too plasticky or gummy if I just use medium. Um, but in general, it's made to protect you from bad wash technique. So there you go. Do, do, do. Hopefully that's... Washes our tea, glazes our hot leaf juice. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. I am here to answer questions. Although it is probably time to start wrapping. So are there any other questions before, uh, before we wrap? I, I make the Reaper paint line, Monohos, so this is what I do. I tend, to I tend to talk paint science every once in a while because no other painter out there is really in a position to talk about it like I am. I had to study all this stuff to make the Master Series paints. Well, I didn't have to, but it really helped. How about that? Also, I was just curious about it. Like, uh, I mean, all painters kind of worry. They kind of uh, kind of wonder why this stuff works. NMM work better at larger, smaller scales. NMM is more difficult to pull off at large scales, like on a bust. Um, it really depends on if you're dealing with a lot of big flat surfaces, I find, whether it's really difficult to pull off. Um, I find that NMM works just fine up to 54 millimeter or so, and bigger than that, uh, it works well if it's like a really elaborate piece like the armor is really elaborate, has a lot of filigree and tooling. Um, but in general, on busts and things, I prefer metallics, shaded metallics, uh, because I think that they, the metallics really come into their own on a big model. Um, oh, I only did the, the one side of the sword, actually. There we go. Sword. Now you can see the roughness of it. And I didn't actually finish the other side. It's just flat. Because I was, I did do the chainmail on the back of the orc, though. Sure. Yay. How many hours? What's the next show? Huh? Uh, oh, Mr. Orc. Yeah. Well, I mean, probably about three and a half ish. Um, now, of course, I'm going slower because I'm explaining a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So, that's the thing. Is if I was just painting him, well, if I was okay. So the time it takes me to paint something, if I'm doing something for, say, the Reaper uh, gallery. Um, my average time is probably eight to 10 hours a model to, to get to that level, to get to a very nice display level. Uh, competition level pieces where you really have to be perfect and you want to really show off your bells and whistles um, can take me anywhere from 25 on up to 120 hours, depending. Soldier took me 140. And that was a 12 inch tall statue. So like a standard person who was watching this video could conceivably do all these tasks at the same amount of time? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, this is a very simple technique, and it had a lot of stippling. It's not really precise, and you don't need to be perfect on your layering, so yeah. I mean, I really, I really do like this orc and his buddies uh, for practice minis. Anything that's got a nice selection of surfaces that are well sculpted for you guys to practice on is a good practice mini. So the fact that he's got a pretty easy sword, and he's got a nice breastplate with uh, well-defined plates and details, and he's got chainmail, makes him a great practice mini for this sort of thing. So yeah, thank you Mubot for putting out my Patreon link. Um, yeah, and the wash helped, uh, yeah. 
Well, it, it was it was a glaze, technically. A wash would have pooled, but I brushed it all off. So, you know, Silverthorn, I mean, it is a kind of a... One person's wash is another person's glaze, right? It, it, just like everything else, we all do it differently, and uh, it can... It can really vary. Um, the best thing that you can do is experiment with different uh, paint consistencies and how they affect your model and decide what you, what, which ones fit your uh, style. But for me, a wash is usually very heavy and has medium in it. And my glaze only had water in it and is very, very light. So, because you always want to go light with your glazes. You can't take them off. You can always put another layer on. You can never take them off. So yeah, I'd be cautious. That's all right, I'm not actually awake either. As usual, I've had my one cup of tea. And I had it late, too. So who knows, it's maybe just kicking in. All right. Well, guys, I think that's our day today. I hope that you all had fun. Somebody asked what next, uh, next week's uh, subject was going to be. I still want to do the glowing eyes on the hellhound. Um, so I'm thinking about maybe doing that one. I also uh, painted up a, or base coated a... Uh, a demoness who would work for Tiflings, because somebody had suggested, uh, had asked about Tiffling skin, and so I actually have a model for that, so we may do that. She, uh, she was naked, so I had to give her a bikini, so I actually green stuffed a bikini on the demoness for the Tiffling tutorial, which I think is kind of uh, awesome, actually. But yes, so we'll see what we do next week. I, don't know, I, don't know. I, I had fun doing this orc, so maybe, oh, and somebody asked about orc skin, too, so I mean, I could keep working on this guy. I don't know. We'll see. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> Depends on how many brain cells I have, right? Indeedy. Thank you, everybody, for coming and keeping us company. Uh, Justin, who are we rating today? We are going to be rating uh, a painter. Looks like they um, they paint minis, but they also do some painting, kind of like you did. Oh, Looks yeah. Looks like they do some, they, they strip the paint and then repaint it, kind of like you did with Soldier 76. Oh, okay. Actually, Soldier, I painted right over his base layer, because he's oh. really, he just comes black and bronze, so he was easy to just, uh, with oh, the okay. Overwatch statues. But yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people who do statue repaints and do an amazing job at it, so that's cool. Yeah. All that's right, good. We have, well, uh, going here. Yeah, so we're going to move over to that person. What kind of uh, model are they working on, do we see? I can't tell what it is, to oh, okay. be honest, but it's a big model. All right. Not. It's, it's, you know... Oh, I like an a, action figure. Ten, kind of. ten, yeah. like, yeah, an action figure size model. Oh, that's cool. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, folks. Go uh, raid our... Uh, next show will be at 3 o'clock today. Yeah. And that is Sadie's, Sadie. Painting Platinum. Yes, Painting Platinum. All right, guys. Yeah, see you guys next week. Well, Have a great one. Thank you for one. stopping by, and uh, we will see you this afternoon. Maybe if I'll see some of that, you. then it. maybe we'll see you for um, Reaper Live. Indeedy. All right, guys. Have a good Spread one. Spread the Reaper love. Keep being awesome. Awesome. Have fun.